This video is on cranial nerves. And we're going to go in order, 1 to 12, we're going to talk about all of them, but we're going to take a quick detour when we talk about cranial nerves 2 and 8, that's vision and hearing. Because the eye and the ears are a little bit more complicated, and you'll see we're going to have subsequent videos on it just to kind of clarify. But for the most part, we're going to talk about them in order. And you got to know your physical exam well. Uh, a lot of question systems have physical exam findings in it, and if you can pick that up, then you can know what nerves affect it. So we'll just go over the physical exam of the cranial nerves now, just really quickly. Cranial nerve 1 deals with smelling. so. A clear nostril gets something fragrant. Smell that. Smell that. Cranial nerve two deals with vision. So you can get two identical eye charts, cover an eye with one, ask them to read the other. That way you can see what line they're reading. Switch. Test peripheral vision. Which finger's moving? Which finger's moving? Cranial nerve three, four, and six deal with the muscles of your eyes. So keep your head straight. H in space. Follow my finger. And then ask if they have blurry vision or double vision. And if they do, isolate the eye. Repeat just to see which eye is affected and when they're getting the double vision. Make sure their eyes react, react to light. So light test. React to accommodation. Look at my finger. Look at the corner of the room. Back at my finger. Cranial nerve 5 deals with sensation of your face and also the muscles of mastication. So poke, poke. Do you feel that? Equal on both sides. Repeat, repeat. Open your jaw. Uh, close your jaw. Mm, make sure their muscles of mastication are all right. Cranial nerve 7 deals with movement of your face, your facial muscles. So raise your eyebrow, give me, give me a great big smile, puff out your cheeks, close your eyes, all that good stuff. Cranial nerve 8 deals with hearing. Do you hear that? Hear that? Equal on both sides. Renee Weber. Cranial nerve 9 and 10 deal with swallowing, so you can do gag reflex. You can also ask them to swallow. And cranial nerve nine, uh, cranial nerve ten in particular deals with things like talking, things like coughing. Make sure you know any hoarseness. Ask them to cough. Note any changes in their cough. Never the sound of the cough. Cranial nerve ten also elevates the palate. So ask them to say ah. Make sure the palate elevates symmetrically. Make sure the uvula is midline. Cranial nerve eleven deals with trapezius, sternocleidomastoid. Shrug your shoulder. Keep it there. Turn your head all the way to the right. Now to the left. Back to the right. Cranial nerve twelve deals with the muscles of your tongue. Stick out your tongue. Ah. Make sure it's not deviated. So cranial nerve exam done. Was that hard? Did it take a while? No, no. So you may just make sure you know the physical exam and it gets better with practice. I remember learning about the cranial nerve exam at my school, like the first time I ever got it, I just got lost, it was, it was way too much. But the more you practice it, the more you learn it, the more you do it, it just becomes second nature. So we're gonna talk about cranial nerves and we'll start with cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve one is your olfactory. Olfactory, that is your smelling. <laughs> it helps you smell. Uh, test it with something fragrant, including nostril, um, etc. The most important fact about cranial nerve one is that it goes straight to the brain. A lot of sensation we said goes to your main relay center. What's your main relay center? That's your thalamus. And your thalamus processes it and sends it where, to, where it needs to go. Your olfactory nerve doesn't go to your thalamus. Yeah, it goes straight to your brain. So I'll just write straight to brain. Straight to brain. We're going to skip cranial nerve 2 for now. We're going to talk about cranial, ner cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6. Those deal with the muscles of your eyes. Cranial nerve 3, 4, 6. Let's say this eraser is your eyeball. You have a muscle that attaches on top, the superior end, we call that your superior rectus. And when it pulls, it pulls your eyes up and you look up. There's a muscle that attaches on the bottom, the inferior end, and when it, we call that the inferior rectus, and when it pulls, your eyes look down, look down. There's a muscle that attaches to the lateral side, we call that the lateral rectus, when it pulls, your eyes look laterally. The muscle that attaches on the medial side, we call that the medial rectus, when it pulls, your eyes look medially. Not too difficult? Well, it gets a little bit more tricky now. There's two more muscles, one attaches obliquely on the top the superior and we call that your superior oblique muscle one attaches on the bottom obliquely we call that your inferior oblique muscle and these muscles because they're pulling at an angle they do the opposite so you your superior oblique when it pulls you look down when your inferior oblique pulls you look up as long as you can remember obliques do the opposite now i don't think it's too hard so your oblique do the opposite. Let me write that down. You have your eye, muscle attaches superiorly, we call that your superior rectus. Muscle attaches on the inferior end, we call that your inferior rectus. Muscle attaches on the lateral side, we call that your lateral rectus. 
Mus muscles attached on your medial side called your medial rectus. So this looks up, looks up. This looks down, looks down. Lateral looks makes you look laterally. Abducts your eye. So if you're looking laterally, you abduct your eye. Abduct. Medial, you look medially. You adduct, adduct, adduct. Got it. Now we said it gets a little tricky. You have these two things that come in at an angle, an oblique angle. You have your superior oblique, SO, and your inferior oblique, IO. And we said, as long as you remember the obliques, do the opposite, you, you're in good shape. So IO, inferior, it will do the opposite. So it'll look up, look up. Superior oblique does the opposite, looks down, looks down. Now, what nerves innervate these muscles? Cranial nerve four is called your trochlear nerve. Trochlear nerve. Trochlea means pulley. So you can imagine it's probably gonna innervate one of these obliques because they kind of look like a pulley. And you'd be absolutely right. In particular, it innervates your superior oblique. This is cranial nerve four. Cranial nerve six. It's called your abducens nerve, abducens. They call it abducens because it abducts. What do you think that's gonna innervate? That's gonna be innervating your abductor, your lateral rectus. So we talked about four and six. Well, how about everything else? Well, there's only one left, cranial nerve three, and that innervates everything else. All right, innervates everything but, innervates everything but, these two, superior oblique, lateral rectus. Easy enough. Cranial nerve three is called the ocular motor nerve because it innervates so much of the muscles in your eyes, not just the rest of these, but they also innervate your levator palpebrae. This is a muscle of your eyelid and opens your eyelid. This is what the levator means. The, the raise, like leviosa. So this is, I'll say open eyelids, open eyelids. We said that your eyes react to things like light and accommodation. Yeah, and they constrict when they do that. And, and there are muscles that constrict your pupil. What do you think innervates those muscles? It'd be none other than your ocular motor nerve. So when it, Constricts the light, that's your sphincter pupillae, the sphincter of your pupil, what a fitting name. And I'll just write light constriction. And also parasympathetic response. When you have parasympathetic response, your eyes constrict. When you have sympathetic response, your eyes dilate to try and get as much uh, light as it can to fight or flight. So parasympathetic, your eyes constrict. And when you're, and we also say your eyes can constrict when there's accommodation, accommodation, and that is going to be your cilia, ciliary muscle. All right, so it innervates so many muscles of your eyes. That's why we call it the ocular motor nerve. Now, just one thing. Let's talk about what can go wrong if these nerves are damaged. If you damage your Cranial nerve four, that's the thing that innervates your superior oblique. Look down. If you damage that, then you won't be able to look down. CN4 palsy. Can't look down. And so their eyes will just drift up. Sometimes they, in the question system, they'll complain of the inability to read a book or walk downstairs. Why is that? Well, you can't look down to read the book and you can't look down to walk down the stairs. So you thought it was very difficult. If you try and read a book, you have to kind of go like this or if you're walking down the stairs, you have to kind of go like this. And so in the question stems, all right, can't read book, can't read book, can't walk down stairs. If you have something wrong with cranial nerve six, that's your abducens nerve. 
That's your lateral rectus. That makes your eyes look laterally. And if you can't do that, then your eyes won't be able to look laterally. And not only that, but you'll have unopposed medial pull. So your eyes are going to look inward, kind of like cross-eyed. So, all right, cranial nerve, six, palsy. Can't abduct medially looking eye. Medial eye. And then last but not least, we have cranial nerve three. We call cranial nerve three innervates everything but these two nerves. And if that goes out, then these are the only two nerves you have. And so your eyes look down and out. So your eyes, your eyes look, how do I want to, how do I want to show this? It will look down and out like this way, like you're looking down here. Why is it doing that? Superior oblique still there, which makes it look down. Your lateral rectus is still there, which makes it look out laterally. So you get down and out eyes. Down and out. And that is your eye palsy. Hope that's not too bad. Hope that's pretty straightforward. Something they want to know is really nitpicky, but I guess they want you to know it. The, the inside of your cranial nerve three, the fibers of the inside, or inside, Real, really deal with the motor aspect. So the um, eye movement. And then the outside fibers seem to deal with the parasympathetic constriction of your eyes. And the reason why they want you to know that is sometimes if you have damage to the peripheral, if you have like an aneurysm or a tumor compressing on the peripheral fibers and damage it, then you can have eye dilation because it can no longer constrict. Eye dilation without anything wrong with the movement. Or if you have something wrong with the inside, like if you have some sort of vascular problem or diabetes because that infects uh, your vascular system, that can infect the inside of your nerve first, then you have something wrong with, you can have something wrong with your motor. So you can have the down and out eye without your eye having any problems with the parasympathetic part, without any problems with constriction and stuff like that. Okay. Usually you get both. Usually you have a down and out eye with dilation. Right? It's, it's just kind of nitpicky facts, but you should know it in case they ask it. So the inside deals with the motor. So you have down and out eyes. Uh, outside deals with the parasympathetic response, which is constriction of your eye. And if you blow that out, then you have dilation of the eye. We call that a blown pupil. Fancy way of saying dilation of the eyes, yeah? That is your cranial nerves three, four, and six. Let's talk about two. There's a reason I kind of skipped two. Two is very complicated. So I want to take some time to kind of talk about it more in depth. So I'm just going to draw the visual pathway out. So this is your eyes, this is your left eye, this is your right eye. And we'll just look at the left eye for now. We'll receive light and visual stimuli and send it down cranial nerve two. That's what we're talking about here. And some of it will cross over and some of it will stay on the same side. And your vision goes to your main relay center. What's your main relay center? If you said thalamus, you'd be right. What particular area of the thalamus that we talk about deals with vision? Wasn't that your lateral geniculate? Geniculate? That's exactly where it goes. So it goes to your lateral geniculate of your thalamus. Then your thalamus will process it and then send it where it needs to go. Where does it need to go? What part of your brain, give you a hint, deals with vision? It'd be your occipital lobe. So it goes to your occipital lobe, occipital, kind of fans out, it goes to your occipital lobe, then you process it, has vision. I'll draw it in the same on the other side. So that was your left eye. How about your right eye? Your right eye does the exact same thing. Takes some light and visual stimuli, processes it, takes it to, and your cranial nerve too will take it, and some of it will cross over. And some of it will stay on this side. Go to your lateral geniculate of your thalamus and, and your thalamus will process it and send it where it needs to go. Where it needs to go is your 
of sabitolobe. That's it. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. It gets a little bit more intricate, and we're going to talk about that in our, our dedicated eye video. But for the most part, for the most part, it is kind of how it looks. All right. And if you understand that, you kind of understand what we're going to talk about in the, for the sake of our cranial nerve discussion. Now, the parts of this pathway have special names. The initial part of your optic nerve, we call the optic nerve part. This part where they kind of cross over each other is called the optic chiasm. Optic chiasm. Chiasm, if you don't know, means crossing. So it's a fitting name. Here, the part where it goes to the lateral geniculate, we call the optic tract. Then once it goes to the lateral geniculate, it gets processed, it flares out and kind of flares out across your head to the occipital lobe, kind of radiates out. It's no longer this neat, nice tract. Kind of flares out, radiates out to your occipital lobe. That's why we call it the optic radiation. Radiation. Then it finally hits your occipital lobe, you process it as vision. Got it? That's cranial nerve two, that's how you see. Now, we talked about a lot of things that deal with your eyes. We talked about cranial nerve two, and then three, and four, and six. I really wrote that. <laughs> that's not a, that's not an actual Roman, Roman numeral. Here we go, cranial nerve six. And it's important to know that because these cranial nerves need to work together seamlessly. They need to work together seamlessly. There's so much more to seeing than cranial nerve two. Yeah, cranial nerve two has to talk to three, four, and six and make sure you're able to see things. You're able to move your eyes and see different things and, and do all those different processes that make vision possible. So these all have to coordinate with each other. I'll give you an example. How about light reflex? If you shine a light in someone's eye, if you shine it in my right eye, then my right eye will constrict. Not only will my right eye constrict, but my left eye will constrict. And they both have to constrict. That just kind of makes sense. If I have a bright light source, I want both of my eyes to constrict. I don't want one eye constricting and one eye dilated and my eyes are just wonky. No, that wouldn't make sense. So they have to coordinate each other seamlessly. Now here's the thing. When I shine the light in my eye, cranial nerve to process that, but what makes it constrict? What muscle constricts? What's the nerve that causes it to constrict? That's cranial nerve three. So when you're doing the light reflex two and three, have to talk to each other seamlessly. How does it do that? Let's talk about the light reflex. Light reflex. If I shine a light into the left eye, it will process it, send it down the optic nerve. Some will cross over, some will stay on the same side. Go to your lateral geniculate. Now here, there's a little branch that comes off and goes to your midbrain. And in your midbrain, there's a nuclei, a processing center that helps coordinate that motion between two and three. Let's blow this up, look at it a little bit closer. So here's your left eye. We said light source comes in and it goes to your optic nerve. goes to your lateral geniculate. And there also is a branch that comes off and goes to a nuclei processing center that can help two and three talk to each other. And the first nuclei is gonna be your left pretectal nucleus. And that nucleus We'll talk to the nerves of cranial nerve three. So I'm gonna draw it in a different color. We'll talk to the left Edinger Westfall nucleus, named after the people that found it. And that will eventually talk to the left ciliary ganglion. Then I, and the ciliary ganglion controls the muscles that constrict your eye, your sphincter papillae that deals with light and your ciliary muscle, which deals with accommodation. Both of them constrict your eye. And that's exactly what it does. So it goes to your eye and constricts it. All right, constrict. It is all part of cranial nerve three. So you get light stimuli going down cranial nerve two. 
And through this kind of system of pulleys, it'll constrict your eye. Now that's your left eye. Didn't I say when you shine a light in the left eye, your right eye also constricts? How does it do that? Well, your left pretectal nucleus will talk to not only the left and then your west fall, but your right and your west fold. And what do you think that'll go to? That'll go to none other than your right ciliary ganglion. And that will eventually constrict your right eye. That, that's the way it can constrict both eyes at the same time. Now let's just, for sake of completion, let's see what happens if we shine the light into the right eye. So light shines into the right eye, goes down the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, where, again, it'll hit your right pretectal nucleus. And it's able to constrict the same eye because it will talk to the right Edinger Westfall. And it's also able to constrict the opposite eye because it also will talk to that left side, left Edinger Westfall. And that's how you do your light reflex. Now that looks complicated. Let's see if you really understand. Let's go through a few practice questions to make sure you really get it. What will happen if we'll say you're right? And your west fall nucleus is damaged. This goes out. So if you shine the light in the right eye, what do you think will happen? Well, the light will come down here, hit your right pretectal nucleus, move to your right EW, and hit a roadblock won't go any further. So your right eye won't constrict. Right eye won't constrict. But it also hits your left EW. And that's perfectly fine. And so your left will constrict. Left will constrict. And friend A, what happens if you go put light in the right left eye? If you, put left in, if you put light in the left eye, go down your optic nerve, go to your left pretectal nucleus, go to your left EW, that's perfectly fine, and your left eye will constrict. Left will constrict. Now when we'll go to your left EW, we'll go to your right EW. Problem. There's the roadblock. Can it constrict? Nope. Right will not constrict. A few more practice questions just to make sure you really got it. Damage to your right optic nerve. Let's clear it. So your right optic nerve is cut. If we shine light in the right eye, what will happen? Nothing. Will it constrict? So the light goes in, hits a roadblock, never even gets to your right protective nucleus. So will it constrict? No. No constriction. In right? How about your left? If it never hits the right protective nucleus, then it never gets to transfer over. So your left will not constrict. So none in left. How about if you put light in the left eye? Light goes into the left eye, goes down the optic nerve, goes to the left pretectal nucleus, goes through the pulley, constricts. Goes, also goes to the right EW, constricts. Perfectly fine. So both constricts. That's the problem with your optic nerve. And then one last thing. Let's say damage to your right pretectal nucleus. What goes on? Let's clear this. Damage to your right pretectal nucleus. Here it goes. Let's put light in the right eye. Light will go in. Hit that roadblock. Can't go any further. Can it constrict? No, can't go any further. Can it constrict the left eye? No, can't go any further. So 
If you put light in the right eye, nothing happens. Nothing happens. How about the left eye? Put light in the left eye, goes down the optic nerve, goes to the left pretectal nucleus, constricts, swings over, bypasses the right pretectal, doesn't touch the pre right pretectal, doesn't touch the roadblock, so it can constrict. So both constrict. Easy peasy. If you draw it out, it makes things so easy. Now it might take a while for you to like really get it down, but I don't think the light reflex will be too hard if you do draw it out. Okay, that's one way your eyes can coordinate through different, different, is that a word? Different muscles. That's not the only way. There's another way. It's a little bit less talked about, but if here, here's my eyes and I want to look side to side, shout out to Ariana. If I look to this side, to my left, then one is laterally rotated and the other eye is medially rotated. Yeah? Let me see if I can draw it out. That'd probably be better. Here's our eyes again. Left, right. And there's a muscle on the side, your lateral rectus. A muscle in the middle, medial rectus. So I got medial rectus, lateral rectus. If I want to look this way, look this way, then your lateral rectus will pull your eye and look this way. But on your right eye, if you want to look this way, then it'll be your medial rectus that pulls. Your medial rectus that pulls. Those are two different muscles innervated by two different nerves. What innervates your lateral rectus? What innervates your abductor? That should be your abducens, cranial nerve six. What innervates your medial rectus? Cranial nerve three. Those are two different muscles innervated by two different nerves and you need them to talk to each other. That way you can look side to side, shout out to Ariana, without it being blurry. Yeah? That way you can do a light, nice seamless transition and your, and your body can do that right away. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. If we look this way, then cranial nerve six will send impulse to your lateral rectus and pull that muscle. And this eye, if it looks this way, has to use your medial rectus and that's cranial nerve three. So cranial nerve three will send a signal and pull that muscle and you're able to look this way. Now let's say we want to look this way. Am I blocking the view? Let's say we want to look this way. This way. Then cranial nerve six will send a impulse to your lateral rectus and pull it that way. But this needs your medial rectus and that's cranial nerve three. And it pull it that way. And that way you can look whatever direction you need to look. Okay? Now there has to be something that links these two, that coordinates these two. Yeah? And sure enough there is. It is something called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. We'll call it the MLF. So again, our example, we're looking this way. Nerve six will send the impulse to the lateral rectus, look laterally, and it'll connect to three via the MLF. And say, hey bud, I need you to look medially. And that way they can coordinate. Kind of like a pulley system. Same thing on the other side. If we're looking this way, cranial nerve six will pull on the lateral rectus and then send the impulse and connect to three via MLF to pull, to pull on the medial rectus. And that way you can look where you need to look. What happens if your MLF is damaged? Uh-oh, that's not good. If it's damaged, we call it INO, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. That's quite a mouthful. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoplegia, meaning your eyes don't move the way they should, internuclear because in the nucleus, particularly your MLF. Something's wrong with your MLF. Something's wrong with this pulley system. It can't communicate. You damage your MLF and knocks it out. Okay, let's see what happens if you damage your MLF. Let's give our example. We're looking this way. Looking this way. 
Your cranial nerve six will touch your lateral rectus. Tell it to look this way, perfectly fine, nothing around there. And then it'll try and connect to your cranial nerve three via your MLF. And it'll hit a roadblock, won't be able to work, won't be able to look this way, won't be able to use your medial rectus, won't be able to adduct, adduct. So INO is a problem with adduction, adduction. Understand, let's do the other example for completion's sake. We're looking this way now. Cranial nerve six will tell your lateral rectus to look this way. Perfectly fine, nothing wrong there. And then it'll try and connect to cranial nerve three, get it to look with it. So it tries to go, connect via MLF, but your MLL, MLF is destroyed and it hits that roadblock. Can't work. You cannot use your medial rectus, you cannot adduct. And that is INO. Now some terminology, if they say left INO, that means your left MLF is destroyed. Left MLF is destroyed. That means your left eye is affected. Left eye is affected. Can't adduct. AD duct. See if we really understand it. We're looking this way. This patient has left eye and notice. This is destroyed, right? We're looking this way. We want to look. We want to look this way. Cranial nerve six will send its impulse. Pull that eye. Perfectly fine. Try and connect with three, but it can't hit that roadblock. So this eye, MLF is destroyed, and the left eye won't be able to adduct. Hope you understand the terminology. Okay, that's that's what they mean by left eye and O. And that's code. All right, I think we've talked enough about cranial nerve two, three, four, and six. How about you? Let's just move on from here. We're done with that. Let's get back on track to just our other cranial nerves. We skipped over cranial nerve five. Let's talk about cranial nerve five. Cranial nerve five deals with the sensation of your face and also your muscles of mastication. Cranial nerve five, AKA your trigeminal nerve. It's called a trigeminal nerve because it has three branches. I'm gonna talk about the sensation portion first. Sensation wise, you have one branch that covers basically your eye to your forehead. Even the sensation of your eye. So when you poke your eye, you feel that. And duly noted, it's called your ophthalmic branch. This deals with your eye and your forehead. The second branch, deals with your maxillary area because your maxillary bones here. What do you think we're gonna call it? We're gonna call it your maxillary area, your maxillary branch. The third branch of your trigeminal nerve is gonna deal with your jaw. What do you think we're gonna call it? We're gonna call it your mandibular branch. Absolutely right, mandibular. So that's sensation. How about motor? Motor deals with your muscles of mastication, eating. So things like your masseter, things like your temporalis, medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid. Your medial, your medial closes your mouth. Uh, M for munch, closing your mouth, close. Your lateral opens your mouth. L for lower the jaw. So, ah, uh, opens. All right, lower jaw. L for lower, L for lateral. <clears throat> now, what can tell you that something's wrong? Well, the sensation part, that's easy. You just poke the face and if you don't have sensation, then something's wrong with your trigeminal nerve. The motor part can be a little bit more tricky. You see, when you eat, when you use the motors of the muscles of mastication, when you eat, Na, 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 na. Your jaw doesn't just go up and down. You don't just chew food like this. Na, 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 na. No, your jaw goes side to side. Yum, yum, yum. And that way you can grind the food down. So your jaw kind of moves side to side. Yeah? And your lateral pterygoid really plays a role in that. Your lateral pterygoid will move your jaw to the opposite side. So your left one will move your jaw to the right. Your right one will move your jaw to the left. So if you have a lesion in your left trigeminal, then you can no longer move your jaw to the right. And so you just have unopposed left movement, left jaw deviation. 
So your jaw will deviate to the same side as your lesion, ipsilateral. Done. We just finished cranial nerves one through six. We're gonna do six through 12 in our next video. Hope you enjoyed it. Oh, by the way, by the way, it's not pronounced pterygoid. <laughs> Don't call it pterygoid, it's just called pterygoid. I, I, I like to mispronounce words because I think it's funny. Nobody else thinks it's funny. But I used to call ptosis, you know, drooping of the eyelids, ptosis, and I called that for like the longest time until someone corrected me. It's really embarrassing. So it's, don't call it pterygoid, it's pterygoid. You wouldn't say pterodactyl, would you? So it's just pterygoid. All right, that was just a joke. But <laughs> other than that, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it clears things up. Thanks.